بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا هو الذي أنزل السكينة في قلوب المؤمنين ليزدادوا إيمانا مع إيمانهم ولله جنود السماوات والأرض وكان الله عليما حكيما ليدخل المؤمنين والمؤمنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ويكفر عنهم سيئاتهم وكان ذلك عند الله فوزا عظيما مركز التعلم الذاتي ريادتك للتعلم جامعة السلطان قابوس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خاتم النبيين أعزاء الطلبة الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسعدنا وجودكم معنا اليوم في تدشين خدمة جديدة من خدمات مركز التعلم الذاتي بجامعة السلطان قابوس وهي ما أطلقنا عليه ندوات الريادة المعرفية هذه الندوات سيعقدها المركز بمشيئة الله تعالى مرتان بالفصل الدراسي ليتناول فيها المركز أحدث ما يطرأ من مستجدات في أي مجال مثل العلوم التقنية والاقتصاد وغيرهم وفي ندوتنا اليوم اخترنا موضوع أثار فضول الكثير وهو سلسلة الكتل بلوك تشين وقد استضفنا اليوم في ندوتنا كوكب من الخبراء في هذا المجال ليثيروا معارف طلابنا في الموضوع المطروح ويشرفني باسم المركز أن أرحب بضيوف ندوتنا اليوم وهم الفاضل نجاح الحمدي نائبة رئيس الخدمات الفنية في البنك المركزي العماني الدكتور عمار العبيداني خبير نقل العلوم والمعرفة والتكنولوجيا بوزارة الخارجية الدكتور خالد طحان الرئيس التنفيذي لشركة تشين عمان الفاضل خالد الحريبي مدير مكتب إدارة المخاطر بجامعة السلطان قابوس وأشكرهم بالنيابة عن المركز وكذلك أشكر مجموعتي دوماس والحاسب الآلي لمشاركتهم معنا لأسهامهم في إنجاح فعالية اليوم مع أطيب الأمنيات بندوة ناجحة ومثمرة ويسيدير كل المحاضرات والجلسة النقاشية الدكتور سالم الحارثي والآن أدعو الدكتور خالد طحان الرئيس التنفيذي لشركة تشين عمان ليقدم محاضرة بعنوان Introduction to Blockchain and the Rule of Chain of Oman Blockchain Company. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'll try to speak English a little bit because it's technical stuff. So I'm just going to go through an introduction to the technology itself, blockchain. Uh, we're going to talk about some of its uses and the opportunities that it actually presents specifically to yourselves. Okay, because such a technology can disrupt uh, careers. So if you're in the start of your career, you can actually use this for a very opportunistic career in this realm. Oh. And uh, furthermore, we're going to give you an update with regards to the company, what its objectives are, and what we're, what we're aiming for. So blockchain itself, um, when the internet came, uh, a lot of companies established themselves in the f from the beginning of the race of the internet realm. So the Amazon was established because they were there from the beginning. Um, we are starting to develop apps perhaps maybe the last four years. So we, we, ha we missed that opportunity to go global with our applications from Oman. Blockchain has just come in. 
So we actually have the opportunity to have someone innovate that next best thing that can go global. So we're not looking at only Oman, we're looking at you literally taking the next best thing to the world. So what does blockchain do? Blockchain came, uh, so the internet, when the internet came, it enabled the exchange of information from person to person. So Oman Post per se, their business went down a bit because you would have usually used them to relay information from person to person, a middleman to do that. But you're able to use the internet now to exchange directly person to person. However, when it comes to anything of value, be it money, you couldn't do that through the internet. And that's why someone like PayPal still exists. Because if I send $10 by email, you're actually sending a copy. So you're doubling the source of money if you're sending a copy. So you couldn't do it with money. So that's what blockchain enables. The exchange of anything of value, be it money, be it your medical records, be it a birth certificate, anything of value, it enables you to exchange it directly from person to person without the need of a third party to enable that transaction, like PayPal. So it has three main components, okay? And these three main components enable three main things, okay? Cryptography gives you a source of trust, okay? And that can, I have the word disrupt there, so it can disrupt any industry based on entrustment of a third party to aid in the movement of anything of value. But in the same time, this can optimize any industry that is based on a third party for the movement of anything of value. So it can actually be looked at as an optimization platform for current industries. And that includes banks, money transfer, electricity companies. You can also e enable the exchange of electricity person to person or house to house rather than through a grid or the company itself. Other than also, the second main feature is it creates a, it's a distributed network. Okay, so it's the network, the computers are all over the world. It's not one central server like Apple, which you can just go block it. No, it's distributed. So you cannot block it per se. And furthermore, it's unchangeable records that are time and date stamp. So you, n once a record is created, it cannot be modified. It's there forever. So when you have a s record like that, you effectively have an unchangeable record, which is useful for any scenario of a supply chain structure like the oil and gas industry or port services or any industry that needs to maintain records in a time and date stamp manner such as medical records, immigration, identity certificates, be they birth certificates, qualification certificates, land registration certificates, etc. The third part, and this is critical, is programmable. And prog because it's programmable, there are new languages coming out for programming to write smart, smart contracts where you automate processes. So you can automate the process of payments to a full department within an institution. And this is key here, because worldwide, there's only around 9,000 programmers in smart contracts right now, whilst there's 9 million uh, web developers. So if we effectively add at least even 10 from Oman who know how to write smart contracts, you've effectively become an asset to the world. And these are jobs that are being seeked at $250,000 a month nearly. That's how crazy the numbers are. So that's one of the things we're doing with the club, which we are making sure that the education is there so that people can actually start writing smart contracts and you can literally start s selling your services to the world. So at its core, the key benefits are it, re it reduces the need for trust between stakeholders, it builds a secure value system, the transfer system, and it streamlines business processes and increases record transparency and ease of auditing such processes. Complex-wise, this is how it looks like. We're not going to bother with that. We're going to look at the simple way how this works because that's all you need to, to get it going. It boils down into something called a private key and a public key. And the easiest way to understand this is always think of it as the public key is a safety deposit box address or a account, bank account number. Okay? And the private key is the actual key that allows you to open that safety deposit box. What's inside the safety deposit box could be a Bitcoin could be a medical record, could be a land registry certificate. And every time you open and close that, account, that safety deposit box, you're creating a record that's unchangeable, that you have done something, okay? So that's how it simply boils down to the private key is the key. And the safety deposit box, the public address, is where you're storing that material. And that's what you could share with other people. But the private key is essential. It identifies you as the owner. So you should never share that. 
Furthermore, you could have multiple keys. So like you could have two keys for each safety deposit box. Then you can control or three keys. So you can have multiple parties controlling one account for per se. So I'm going to change something now. I've said it was a source of truth earlier, but it's, I'm going to change that to it's a source of consensus. Consensus means like a agreement or like a, 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 a democracy. You're all agreeing that the source of that the records being created are the source of truth. Okay. And as long as majority of the network are truthful, it is a source of truth. So it's critical to note that this is a source of consensus. And if only one party owns, say, for example, the Ministry of Health owns this, only, they're the only owners of this blockchain, then it's only as truthful as the Ministry of Health. If I only own the, the blockchain, then it's, it's only as truthful as I am. So the idea is when you're looking at a, so you, the more you diversify the number of people on that network, the harder it is for them to collaborate to corrupt it. So that's why, for example, public blockchains, it's anyone from around the world can join it. And that's why it becomes very hard to get them to collaborate to corrupt because there's so many people on it. There's also a different type of blockchain, which is called permission, which is controlled who can join. Okay. So this is for more controlled environments where you have maybe, for example, government agencies storing data. But the idea is it's always better to have five ministries with very different agendas on the same chain because that way you can, you'll you never get Ministry of Health to collaborate with the central bank, for example. They just have different agendas on their plate. So they won't collaborate to corrupt. It will always be a source of truth because they have so much diverse uh, objectives out of the chain. The other thing, and this is another academic point, but this is more research-based. So the consensus, how is it achieved, this uh, agreement on source of truth? There's different protocols to the consensus algorithm, proof of work, proof of stake, proof of importance, uh, federated Bithantin. So there's a lot of research on this, especially on the public side mm -hmm. of chains. To, and that's another academic side where potentially Oman can lead in the research side of improving uh, transaction throughput through different tra uh, consensus algorithms. So that's another academic perspective where Oman can lead. So there's a smart contract, which is literally something you can become an uh, asset to the world today. And this, you could literally revolutionize the whole technology industry within this space. So the current system is inefficient. So I these squares that you see here, they could represent hospitals. They could represent banks. Okay. The idea is the current system, when everyone is trying to relay information and there's middlemen in between trying to communicate, I've experienced in the hospital environment. It just becomes inefficient, it's expensive, it's error sensitive, and vulnerable. However, if you have a universal source of truth, which is being shared by everyone, you suddenly have a consistent, efficient, secure, and resilient system. I'm going to go through a quick example in the hospital scenario. So you have four hospitals here. Uh, each one of them has their own database of records. And Three of them are using the same platform, whilst one of them is using a different platform. So this, from a security perspective, is very good, because if hospital A gets attacked, the other, th the other three remain safe, so the data remains safe. So security-wise, this is brilliant. However, from a patient services perspective, this is a disaster, because if someone is going to hospital C, they actually have, uh, and they were previously in hospital A, they actually have to re try and get that information, and that could cause errors in the transfer of that information process. So what can be done? Current solutions, and then we'll look at blockchain. So the three hospitals can be linked via virtual local area network, okay, via Omantel. Very possible, but very expensive, firstly. Secondly, hospital D, which uses a different platform, cannot contribute to that pool of information, okay? And uh, that, that so you cannot create a universally encompassing platform. You get what I mean? Hospital D always remains out of the picture, but they can read, for example, the information from the other hospitals. Other things you can do is create a central database. Again, the hospitals on the same platform can share that information, but this represents a big security risk because if one attack into the central database, everything goes down. And again, Hospital D is still out of the picture. They're not able to get the information. They can only view it, but they cannot contribute to the pool of information. Instead, you can utilize blockchain, okay? What you're effectively doing here is you're adding on 
like an add-on to the current system. So whatever platform you have, you're adding on a system of verification of certain, so like a discharge summary. Every time a patient visits the hospital, they end up with a discharge summary. That is being hashed and stored on the blockchain where you're effectively now having a source of truth and each patient has their they discharge summaries all on their phone. So if they're going to Thailand for treatment, they have access to their records. So what have you done here? So the hospital still is, still is in power. They have their data, but you've just empowered every single patient with a source of their records. Wherever they go in the world, they have their records with them. Okay? And they're verified as authentic, time and date stamps. So it's just like verified by Visa. This is verified by blockchain. And you encompass everyone. Private hospitals can come on because this is an add-on. Insurance companies can have read access. You, as a patient, are in control. You can literally tell the insurance company, here you go, I had a uh, presentation in the hospital. This is my rec visit. Issue me my funds to re uh, refund me for the visit. So you, can get, you are in control. You're empowered as an individual. So two ways you can look at it. Patient-centric, where there's two keys, you remember? the sample we gave you, two keys. One is in your ID card, for example, and the other one is with the hospital, and that enables the storage on the blockchain. Or you can have an institution-centric, which is only one key, and the hospital is recording data onto the blockchain. This would be more secure, because even if that hospital got attacked, it's only the patients that are in the hospital at that moment that get compromised, because it's two keys you need to actually record anything. <coughs> so types of blockchain. Um, I'm going to simplify it to there is private and public or permissioned and permissionless. Okay. And um, Bitcoin is an example of a, pri of a public blockchain. Okay. It was one of the first public blockchains that ever existed. And the set hospital records I gave you is an example of a permissioned blockchain, a controlled environment. Okay. And then there's consortiums. Consortiums are where there's a controlled number of users coming in. So there's a lot of companies now out there who have already created consortiums. But in my view, we should be creating our own consortium and taking that to the world. Today is, that's why we look at blockchain today, because we can actually lead. Five years from now, fine, we can join a consortium that has been established, etc., etc. But for today, no, we lead. We focus on our own leadership here. And if we win, great. If we don't win, it's fine but we can join a consortium down the line. Not today. So I'm going to play a video on uses of blockchain. Focus on number 19. I think that's the most important one. The blockchain is one of the most promising new technologies for the future. So what is it? It's a distributed ledger technology that underlies cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and provides a way to record and transfer data that is transparent, safe, auditable and resistant to outages. The blockchain has the ability to make the organizations that use it transparent, democratic, decentralized, efficient and secure. The blockchain is likely to disrupt many industries in the coming 5 to 10 years. These are some of the industries it's already disrupting. Number 1. Banking and Payments Some people say that the blockchain will do to banking what the internet did to media. Blockchain technology can be used to give access to financial services to billions of people around the world, including those in third world countries who don't have access to traditional banking. Technologies like Bitcoin allow anyone to send money across borders almost instantly and with very low fees. E-banks like Barclays are also working on adopting blockchain technology to make their business operations faster, more efficient and secure. Banks are also increasingly investing in blockchain projects and startups. IBM predicts that about 15% of banks will be using the blockchain by the end of 2017. Number 2. Cybersecurity Although the blockchain ledger is public, the data is verified and encrypted using advanced cryptography. This way the data is less prone to being hacked or changed without authorization. The blockchain eliminates the need for middlemen, making it more efficient than many legacy systems in cybersecurity. Number 3. Supply Chain Management with blockchain technology, transactions can be documented in a permanent decentralized record and monitored securely and transparently. This can greatly reduce time delays and human mistakes. It can also be used to monitor costs, labor, and even waste and emissions at every point in the supply chain. This has serious implications for understanding and controlling the real environmental impact of products. The blockchain can also be used to verify the authenticity or fair trade status of products by tracking them from their origin. 
Number 4. Forecasting Blockchain is set to change the entire approach to research, consulting, analysis, and forecasting. These technologies can be used to place and monitor bets on anything from sports to stocks to elections in a decentralized way. Number 5. Networking and Internet of Things Samsung and IBM are using blockchain technology for a new concept called ADEPT, which will create a decentralized network of IoT devices. Operating like a public ledger for a large number of devices, it would eliminate the need for a central location to handle communications between them. The devices would be able to communicate to each other directly to update software, manage bugs, and monitor energy usage. Number 6. Insurance The global insurance market is based on trust management. Blockchain is a new way of managing trust and can be used to verify many types of data in insurance contracts, like the insured person's identity. So-called oracles can be used to integrate real-world data with blockchain smart contracts. This technology is very useful for any types of insurance that relies on real-world data, for example, crop insurance. Number 7. Private transport and ride sharing. The blockchain can be used to create decentralized versions of peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing apps, allowing both car owners and users to arrange terms and conditions in a secure way without third-party providers. The use of built-in e-wallets can allow for car owners to automatically pay for parking, highway tolls, and electricity top-ups to the vehicle. Number 8. Cloud Storage Data on a centralized server is inherently vulnerable to hacking, data loss, or human error. Using blockchain technology allows cloud storage to be more secure and robust against attacks. Number 9. Charity Common complaints in the charity space include inefficiency and corruption, which prevent money from reaching those who are meant to have it. Using blockchain technology to track donations can let you be sure that your money is going to end up in the right hands. Number 10. Voting Probably one of the most important areas of society that blockchain will disrupt is voting. The 2016 US election is not the first time certain parties were accused of rigging election results. Blockchain technology can be used for voter registration and identity verification, and electronic vote counting to ensure that only legitimate votes are counted and no votes are changed or removed. Creating an immutable, publicly viewable ledger of recorded votes would be a massive step forward in making elections more fair and democratic. Number 11. Government. Government systems are often slow and opaque and prone to corruption. Implementing blockchain-based systems can significantly reduce bureaucracy and increase security, efficiency, and transparency of government operations. Number 12. Public Benefits The public benefits system is another sector that suffers from slowness and bureaucracy. Blockchain technology can help assess, verify, and distribute welfare or unemployment benefits in a much more streamlined and secure way. The blockchain is also a good contender for implementing a basic income. Number 13. Healthcare. Another industry that relies on so many legacy systems and is ripe for disruption is healthcare. One of the challenges hospitals face is the lack of a secure platform to store and share data. They're also often victims of hacking because of outdated infrastructure. Blockchain technology can allow hospitals to safely store data like medical records and share it with the authorized professionals or patients. This will improve data security and can even help improve accuracy and speed of diagnosis. Number 14. Energy Management Energy management has been a highly centralized industry for a long time. Energy producers and users cannot buy it directly from each other and have to go through the public grid or trusted private intermediary. Number 15. Online Music Several blockchain startups are coming up with ways for musicians to get paid directly from their fans without giving up large percentages of sales to platforms or record companies. Smart contracts can also be used to automatically solve licensing issues and better catalog songs with their respective creators. Number 16. Retail. When you shop, you trust the retail system of the store or the marketplace. Decentralized blockchain-based retail utilities work differently. They connect buyers and sellers without a middleman and associated fees. Sorry, Amazon. In these cases, trust comes from smart contract systems, the security of exchanges, and built-in reputation management systems. Number 17. Real Estate Some of the issues in buying and selling real estate are bureaucracy, lack of transparency, fraud, and mistakes in public records. Using blockchain technology can speed up transactions by reducing the need for paper-based record keeping. It can also help with tracking, verifying ownership, ensuring accuracy of documents, and transferring property deeds. Number 18. 
Crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has become a popular method of fundraising for new startups and projects in recent years. Crowdfunding platforms exist to create trust between project creators and supporters, but they also charge high fees. In blockchain-based crowdfunding, trust is created through smart contracts and online reputation systems, which removes the need for a middleman. New projects can raise funds by releasing their own tokens that represent value and can later be exchanged for products, services or cash. Many blockchain projects have now raised millions of dollars through such token sales. Although it's still early days and the regulatory future of blockchain-based crowdfunding is uncertain, it's an area that holds a lot of promise. Number 19. Your industry. If your industry deals with data or transactions of any kind, it's likely a field that can be disrupted by blockchain technology. The space is wide open and the opportunities are many. So basically, as we said, number 19. Now, number 19 is really key because that's where we can innovate. And we've already gotten three with, and two more following innovative applications from society, young entrepreneurs that are first in the world. And one of them literally just Shell announced it and they're tr we're going to start racing Shell with that specific application. They literally just announced it yesterday and we were thinking of it for the last two months. So we're getting that developed and we're going to start a race with Shell worldwide. So that's where it's, this stands out. It's the current new application models. So it's just fresh. You can actually devise within any environment a new application model for this. So why do we look at this today? So we're looking at it today specifically because, as we said, it, it's an opportunity to tap into nor new sources of revenue, be it for yourself or the government services. It's an opportunity to innovate and an opportunity to lead. Furthermore, it's, you can utilize its benefits where it improves services, such as the hospital scenario we gave. It improves services to society. So just giving you an overview on the company. This is the structure of the company. Our focus is on setting up the infrastructure, okay? uh, be it permissioned or permissionless. We are here to make ensure uh, a secure and safe environment when, it looks, when we're looking at permissionless. So we want to minimize its risks and utilize its benefits, optimize its benefits. And from a permission perspective, we're setting up a network so that we can have that data within Oman, okay? And we can utilize the benefit of blockchain. Furthermore, from an application development perspective, there are national initiatives we are taking forward from applications for the government services. And we have innovative applications from society that are being taken forward for development. And we're having workshops. The workshops, the objective here is you look at different work environments, you dig deep and you actually find out. So I can give you examples from the hospital scenario because I've lived the pains of the hospital system. So people who have lived the environment are the best people to tell you what are the problems that can be solved by blockchain. And that's why we have workshops. And we're education, basically. We're setting up education for corporations. We're setting up education for smart contracts via the club. That's critical because that makes you a weapon for the world, actually. And uh, research into the technology and things like the research council's upgrade program for students where you effectively can go from a, a graduation uh, project to an entrepreneur within it within right after graduation and that's things that we will be helping to bring forward and have special events to find the investors for you etc and collaborate with you to make sure you're actually growing very quickly with your application and incubator environments, which are also collaborating with Riyadh on to make sure you have the facilities and the experience around you to make sure you grow into an entrepreneur and a successful business as fast as possible. So I, I just added this slide as a last thing. It's very important to note that there's a lot of th people now coming in blockchain trying to sell you products that are enterprise ready. That's not for today. That's something you look at five years from now. Today, you need to be doing proof of concept and innovating. You can adopt certain things to improve efficiencies, etc. but really, the bulk needs to be here. And that's the one that actually gives us that opportunity to lead in the world and actually gives Oman a brighter future and each one of you an entrepreneurial bright future. Thank you very much. للدكتور خالد طحان والآن يسعدني أن أدعو الدكتور عمار العبيداني خبير نقل العلوم والمعرفة والتكنولوجيا بوزارة الخارجية ليقدم محاضرة بعنوان The Role of Blockchain Club in Oman فلتفضل
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Hello again. I just realized that some, somebody doesn't speak Arabic here, so we can make it in English. Uh, the idea here today, uh, I'll be starting by uh, giving a brief of what happened over the last one year, and then I'll talk about the blockchain uh, club initiative and why this was established. So one month back, we had to communicate with different uh, national organizations, starting by CBO and other organizations, financial and non-financial. We had the thought of, uh, you know, uh, running faster towards the future instead of just looking at the things around us. And the first, we, we looked at different things, IOTs, artificial intelligence. Everybody talks these days about artificial intelligence and the big data and the blockchain. And we realized that uh, these things are all important, but where shall we start? And where shall we develop the capacities? And we had to identify if whether we need to be uh, operators or developers. And all of these questions came down to uh, develop an institutional team from the different uh, government uh, parties, financial, non-financial, to run uh, a program for uh, doing a symposium at a national level. So we collaborated, we facilitated different things with different organizations to come up with a program, a solid program, that makes us really understand what blockchain is. We didn't want the internet uh, stuff and the YouTube. It's there for everybody. We really wanted everybody to understand before we go for the symposium. So we came up with, with an idea of having uh, an awareness program as well as a seed project by which we can discuss during the symposium. So the symposium was two parts. The first part was uh, open and the other part was closed. Two days open, two days closed. The two days open was for everybody. The two days closed was for specialized uh, personnel from different organizations. We have embedded even the regulators to these different teams. And these projects, two of them was with the financial uh, side and the other are uh, with the service. I will not talk about the whole story. But what we've realized in the day we have executed the or inaugurated the symposium, we find out that those whom we trained, who basically not trained, but we, those who were part of the awareness program from these different institutions really had the right questions to ask all of the international experts. And we came up with a clear understanding how to become developers instead of just be uh, operators like what, what, what ha what's been happening for a very long time. And this is not just about Oman, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Thank you. So what happened all through the uh, symposium of the, uh, His Excellency Abdul Salam, he was so excited with SJRF, State Government uh, Fund. They were part of this uh, uh, program. And they were so excited to go to the future. And they said, let's you know, do something that helps uh, help us to be developers. And they have established a company. And the first, second day, second day. And they have established a club as well. And for us to uh, basically uh, reach out to the uh, objectives that everybody was thinking about, we knew that we'll need to have a process. And that process basically will rely on developing the local capacities, the brains. We knew that blockchain, yes, people claim that, you know, there are programs to teach blockchain like undergraduate and postgraduate. That's true. But we looked, at, uh, we looked at it at a different way. We said, why don't we, a blockchain or, or any other, uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution kind of, uh, you know, technology. It's just an extra mile on top of the education and on top of the experience you have for you to focus at certain application or technology so that you can deal with or develop. So the club was developed for that reason to uh, spread the awareness among the society, the local society, as well as develop the capacities within Oman. So for spreading the, uh, the, the awareness, 
we planned different events. But there was a big challenge for us to support Khaled and the company to basically start developing these programs. And that was by finding the right, I, would, I wouldn't say the right, but I would say that they, the most enthused uh, local capacity to come and work uh, with us. And the platform was developed and the registration happened. Now we have more than 700 members uh, in, the, in, the, in the club, and most of them, most of, most of them are Omanis, but we do have members from outside Oman. We've closed the registration now because we are developing the, uh, the website. Yesterday I, I called my webmaster uh, and asked him, why did you close this? He said, we are still in the registration process of hosting it here in Oman, because it wasn't hosted in Oman. So this will be open very soon. Please spread the news to all of the, uh, the your colleagues. So my idea today is to go through the website and tell you what the website is because we, you know, thought about it and we said it's not right to go around. It's good to go around and talk about it, but it's much easier if we can bring the website to you, bring it to your phone. So we said we will develop a website that is uh, clear, informative, uh, gives the right awareness, as well as it's an interactive kind of website where you can, you know, uh, communicate with all of the members via the, web via the website through your phone. So we are developing now a phone app. It, the, our aim is uh, for this phone app to be much easier than WhatsApp. Just imagine, WhatsApp is everywhere. Imagine you have something in your hand, and you're interested, you can discuss different technologies through the phone at any time you want. So I'll go through the website. Obviously, the website also gives the opportunity for uh, job seekers in this area. So you can get yourself trained, uh, and you can also uh, find uh, vacancies of jobs related to your background. So the website, obviously you've, you've seen the slider talking about a few things. It's still under development. Uh, when the club was developed, uh, a board of trustees was, uh, uh, was starting from the board of uh, trustees. The uh, honorable chairman of uh, the club is uh, His Excellency, His Highness, Sayyid uh, Taymour bin Asad Al Said. The deputy is uh, His Excellency Abd Salam Murshidi, obviously. Najah is everywhere. <laughs> She's there as well. We have other guys, Dr. Yusuf Blushi for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You are important, yeah, that's why. Uh, we have uh, other uh, personnel from the different organizations. Obviously, the, the, board, the, the blend you see in the Board of Trustee is basically reflecting the different uh, uh, government institution in Oman, as well as the academic institution, the research institution, to be part of planning how this club should uh, send the message and uh, educate as well as find the right opportunities through you know the, the, the different personal uh, ideas and thoughts. For the uh, club itself, for the club itself, it's still open. I'm expanding it. The day I've received uh, the notice to handle the uh, club. Uh, there were a few, uh, few teams. Obviously, they were called committees. I've changed them to teams because I know it's a club, so let's have teams. Let's, let's make it fun. Um, uh, I didn't have a uh, blockchain technology team, so I added a blockchain technology team. I've added also cyber security and risk assessment team. We don't want to go with any technology. We need to understand which technology we should follow and which technology is good for Oman, as well as secure for Oman. Uh, we also added, yes, the day before yesterday, a new uh, block, which is not yet here, and it's about uh, the uh, integration of uh, digital technologies. Why, again, the question is, why did we start with blockchain? If you've seen in the mission earlier, the idea is not to just master blockchain. It's a process. Those are steps. We cannot go to AI artificial intelligence without being strong in our foundation, a trusted foundation, a secure foundation, which is blockchain, one of them, but now we are mastering it and developing it through Khaled. So if you have a strong base, 
we can build on it technologies as well as we can utilize it for our future uh, technologies like the big data, the Internet of Things, and eventually the uh, artificial intelligence. Some are trying to use artificial intelligence before mastering IoT and uh, uh, the big data. You cannot have a smart interactive system without having these uh, ready. Now the, the question is, uh, shall we get it out of the shelf or develop it in-house? And there where the club comes. We want all of the developers to be from Oman. It's good to collaborate with the international. But again, having the extra mile through the club will give us the opportunity to lead in the future. So that, that block will be there uh, in, in, in few in few days, maybe maybe tonight. I've got a guy who works 24-7. Uh, just told him last night, apparently he was busy with something else. Uh, uh, I will go straight away to the training center. Uh, the forum is not yet ready. The forum is going to be the phone app, which uh, will be uh, free for everybody. By the way, it's free to register in this uh, platform. Uh, but for the courses, we intended not to make them free. We will pay most of it, but uh, each one of you and anybody else who wants to uh, utilize this service and get trained, they'll have to pay just for the commitment reasons. Uh, obviously, like what Dr. Khaled said, if you get certification uh, for being coder in smart contract, then you are not an asset at an Oman level. You are an asset at a, a global level. So you can get projects even from uh, you know, any other country. Uh, we, wa we are in the edge of developing our own uh, training programs. Uh, these will be, some of them will be video, some of them will be online, but we are also intending to have a physical uh, uh, training programs. We had just a new uh, comer to the team uh, two days back, and he's a trainer in IoTs, big data, blockchain, He's doing a lot of things and he's training, going around training. Now again, the other reason for establishing this uh, platform is to bring all of those who are interested in this uh, uh, domain to work together collaboratively because we've got a lot of those interested working around but they are not communicating to each other and having all of them together at one place will give us the opportunity to advance faster. Now. These ones who are expert, as well as those ones who are new, through the interactive uh, platform that we are uh, developing through your phone, will make a jump in uh, you know, ideas and experience you will share with those who really understand the different uh, technologies. The platform is also uh, open for high school students. Uh, we believe that, uh, like what Khaled said, down the line in five years, you'll see stuff in the market and you know, as uh, you know, if we are thinking at that time to be operators, not developers. But now, uh, if we train the youth or the university student from now down the line, you will be the developers. You can utilize it. You can understand it better than than us, than most of us, I would say. I don't want to talk more. Uh, this is what it is. Uh, we have added one icon for Oman. We are also promoting Oman. We want people not to just you know, look at the technologies we are doing. We also want to market our man and uh, tell them that uh, it is nice to be part of this community. Uh, that's all. I tried to be easy. Okay. Shukran. Thank you very much. Shukran to Dr. Ammar Al-Ubaydani. And now Dr. Salim Al-Harithi, Mudir Maktab Idarat Al-Makhatar by Jamaa Sultan Qabous to give a speech by the SQU New Risk Management Vision in the light of blockchain technology, big data, and artificial intelligence. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I don't know if I can talk much after Dr. Khalid and um, Dr. Ammar. Uh, okay, I'm from Risk Management Office, and we thought that we want to come up with something very, very important, and very essential to achieve our uh, vision. So. What is our vision is to be leader in the world and uh, when it comes into risk management. And when I say in the world, it means in the academy, higher academic institution. And I told the vice chancellor, I said, Salim, you are dreaming. I said, let me dream, it's free. So let us uh, take it from there. What we do in my office, we manage both risk and opportunities. You can't talk about risk without opportunities. Threats, al-makhatar, all for us. 
she ain't. So we are managing those. So the way you manage risk, we call those, uh, those ones uh, down risk threats, is sort of very, very close to the way you manage uh, opportunities. It's just like a coin, okay? You have both two sides. 99% of institutions, they look to at one side. Don't, don't, don't do, do, don't do this, don't smoke, don't whatever, don't. But the other side is very, very important, which is presented by Forrest, Ertinamil Forrest. So we manage both. Now, in order to achieve this, we have to come up with something special. Otherwise, our vision is in 10 years, we have to be leaders. We have completed two years, and I'll show you what we have done so far. Well, the first thing, okay, we said, we have done a lot of things. Now we are in a process to really adapt big data, artificial intelligence, and blockchain. We believe that these three technologies, there are some applications where we can use all of them at once, and some applications where you can use one of these. You don't need really to use all of them at once. If you can manage to use all of them at once, it's very, very powerful. Especially if you collect, imagine you are at a SKU and you collect a lot of data, uh, data are very, uh, very fast and changing, very dynamic, uh, a lot of data in a short time, some data are uh, accurate, some data are not accurate, and then you come up with some methodologies and the mathematics models, you do artificial intelligence, this is a machine intelligence opposite to natural intelligence, so you try to mimic an insan, you can make it so, uh, uh, it's not an easy thing. You have to do a lot of um, uh, uh, models and mathematics uh, uh, approaches. Then you use blockchain where it was explained enough, I think, uh, by Dr. Khaled. So if you look to all of these three technologies, they have their own risk. They have their own risk, okay? Any technology. I'm a nanotechnologist. I'm a physicist. Nanotechnology, there are some positive and negative things about it. So any te technology does have some risk. But we want to use these three technologies to reduce risk, uh, rather than looking into their intrinsic, their natural uh, risk. Okay? Now, let us talk to the, the way we want to do it. We look into the features. Dr. Khaled talks a lot, and Dr. Ammar about uh, blockchain features. Mumayezat. Once we understand, because we want to close the gaps, okay, want to, uh, once we understand the features of each technology, we'll be able to say, aha, uh -huh, we can use this feature to solve our problem. So these are features of uh, big data. Big data are a uh, variety of them. They are coming from different sources. If you, if you take Sultan Qaboos University, we have hundreds of thousands uh, type of data. Uh, academic records, students' activities, academics, uh, pay, uh, payment, name it. It's, they are coming from different sources. And some of them, they come very, very fast. Nowadays, everyone is using social media, using email, and so on and so forth. And also, uh, some of them are not accurate, so you need to clean this data. And some of them are not really accurate, so then you need really to uh, to correct those uh, data. And some of them need to be changed or to look after sometimes uh, you need to ready to decide if you want new data or you want to change data or you want to ignore data. Artificial intelligence, there are some features also. They use big data, they are adaptive. So they observe the results, the machine observe the result and learn how to do better. So it's just like, uh, like an intelligent insan. You have an experience, you, you learn how to do it better. So that is by machine. They are reactive also, they monitor and make decisions. I'm not saying here artificial intelligence will be replacing a human being. It's impossible. Forget about it. But what I'm saying that is a tool which will, he will help people to make decisions. And also, it's a forward thinking. You can do some calculations in mathematics and predicting the future, okay? What will be coming in the future. So this is very good. And also concurrent, it can handle multiple tasks, what is happening and uh, things which are interacting simultaneously. Okay, these are very, very important. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but most of these features here will be able to help us in risk management. So, what is the first example, what we think? If you look to the global risk, you have risk into terrorism, risk into financial risk, risk into food, 
risking to disease, infectious disease, uh, risking to floods, and uh, uh, just name it. But these risks are connected. They are not isolated. It's impossible. And the, the, this dot here, you can decide on the strength and the weakness of this risk. But all of them, they are connected. So you have to come up with the, uh, a holistic approach on how to deal with risks. Because, because you can't isolate a risk. For example, a student who is not doing well, that risk might be related to his business or to the curriculum or to the instructor. Or, or to the system. So things are really related. You can see that these risks are very different, complex, linked, time dependent, and uh, there are multiple uh, players and stakeholders, no boundaries, and different degree of impact. So a disease in South Africa can, be, can have an impact, huge impact compared to the same disease in Oman, for example. So if you look at these, all of these, Imagine this map is Sultan Qaboos University. So we use big data, we collect data, we use artificial intelligence to do some predictions, then we use also a blockchain to disseminate, to distribute <coughs> the information to everyone. So it is transparent, or it's distributed uh, information. So that's the first thing we are thinking uh, to start with. This is more than five years project. It's not an easy thing to do. The second example, well, we are into the risk management area. We want to improve the field itself. If you look to the risk management processes, the first thing, what you need to do, this is very simplified. You need to identify risk, then you evaluate them. Then you put the acceptance level you want to deal with them. Then you introduce mitigations. Then you do review. This is a complete cycle. There are two gaps which we need to handle. And people, they don't know about this. The first one is implementation of risk responses. <coughs> a lot of people and whom sigil in Mahathir risk register, they say, look, we'll be doing this and this and this, but they don't do it. So we want to use blockchain technology in closing this gap. The other gap is capturing the lessons. People from risks, you identify the risk. After five years, your project is done or your strategy is finished, you develop a new strategy or a new project, you forgot the lesson learned. <laughs> this can be easily adapted by blockchain because things are immutable, uh, immutable, you cannot change them, so people will see what has been done if those risks repeated again. So this is a second example. The, uh, the, sec uh, the third example, I spent two months in the finance department at SQU. What we found was this related to finance. We call it in Arabic, if you want to pay money to anyone, you start from here, you end up there. So let's say I'm from College of Science, I want to pay to Salim al Harfi a bonus, I'll go through this chain, going to uh, personnel and other things, auditing, at the end, uh, and al -khazina, al the, the finance, they have to pay to me. What we found, these chains here, they are the ones really introducing a lot of risk. Number of chains, the more you have number of chains, the more you have risk department. The more you have uh, rings connections, most of the risks are coming from these risk uh, ring connections. And rings quality, some departments are not really doing very good job. So these affect these ones. So we can use blockchain in just from start up to the end easily without going into the hustle. This will reduce the job of auditing department, tadqiq uh, and so on and so forth, just by monitoring uh, the payment, which was mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Khalid. So uh, this is a very, very simple example, and the payment can be even outside, okay? For the time being, if we buy an instrument, we want to pay a company outside of Oman, then we have to go to the bank, through the bank. It takes a little bit time, okay? But this can be done directly but of course, it doesn't mean that we'll be eliminating the bank. No, the bank will have a role to play uh, when it comes into these type of uh, transactions. Some mistakes will be avoiding them. For example, there can be a karar from vice chancellor. A person will go to the finance department and being paid, then the auditing will come and say, sorry, you didn't follow all these steps. How come? So then you have delays. 
So this is the thing really we can just use blockchain uh, just to, uh, to do this. The other thing which we have developed and test this model, we call it, it's a, it's a model we call it the uh, elephant and opposite elephant. What is this? What I do every week, I look far, and if any risk coming to SQU, I advise the vice chancellor, that is my, uh, one of my responsibility, that there is a risk coming. I can see it from far. Then it's just uh, like an elephant. Then once its approach is very close to you, if you don't do anything, then it's too late. So what we do, we do the reverse. We, so we try to see the big elephant far. Mathalan, I did with unemployment, متحدث باسم الجامعة قتل الكهرباء عن الجامعة all of these were these examples and we tell him be careful if you don't pay electricity bill of SQU the electricity will be shut and this did happen okay so what what we do here I change this model into something I call it uh, the uh, tracking pulse radar blockchain model what we can do is this you can see a threat coming Imagine you have a camera, you capture that problem from far. Then you use artificial intelligence to predict what is the next step, how that problem will happen based on big data you have accumulated. Till you get here, you know everything about that problem. It's a dynamic, it's changing with time. So that will help decision makers really to track the problem from the beginning up to the end. So this is one of the things uh, we can use uh, uh, blockchain. We have tested this manually, and it's uh, very, very nice. I can give you five examples where we have tested this, and it did work. But at the end of the day, it depends on the decision makers to get a decision. Or well, I'm a physicist. One of the thing is, this is snooker biliardo. What you want, you can adapt the Laden approach. Bin Laden can understand that he had a belief. He said that, look, regardless what he has done or, or uh, if it's good or bad, uh, bad is not my business. Uh, I'm not the one who can comment on that. But I'm trying to learn from situation. He had a belief. Then he said, OK, let me decentralize this belief. Yemen, different places, Afghanistan, and others. Yeah. This is very, very important in risk management. So it's just like a snooker or a billiard ball. It, it has energy and momentum. You transfer this energy in a decentralized way. One of the features Dr. Hali talked about blockchain is decentralizing information. So we think this can help in this uh, uh, application. Well, the last one. And this I used it long, long time ago, 15 years back in Bank Master. I called it intruder model. These are my model from understanding my science. I'm a physicist. An intruder model, you have a system. We know that Darasuna, we were taught when we were kids that Zarat Kawan Minal Electronatu Nawa. Okay? So this uh, uh, atom consists of uh, neutrons and protons and electrons. If you interrupt it with the light or magnetic field or something, then the, the system will start behaving in a strange way. Imagine that you are sitting at home having a dinner with the family, a sudden intruder, Dakhil, Dakhil, he came and uh, started, uh, 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 everyone will behave differently. Some of them will say, come and have a dinner with us. Some of the kids will come and say hello, and some of them will just continue eating. So they'll behave differently. I use this model in Bank Mascot. So I, was, I used to be in a focus group of Bank Mascot. So I asked them, to have a meeting on a certain topic, then I'll be an intruder, somebody coming outside and starting disturbing them. So what happens, I found that they, they didn't agree. They thought that they agreed because they are coming from the same environment. So also we can use this idea of probing, disturbing the system and see the consequences. This is very, very good when you identify risk. It's very, very important. Now, every institution does have you know, risk register. And this risk register, in fact, are really discrete, are not dynamic. They review it some institution every three weeks, uh, every three months, or every six months. Okay? But what we are trying to do is to come up with 
dynamic risk register. So anything, remember, each risk has an owner. And what Dr. Khalid say, <coughs> each record will have an owner. So we use that feature just to capture uh, or to enhance our risk register using blockchain technology. Thank you. شكرا للدكتور سالم الحارثي والان ندعوكم للجلسه النقاشيه فليتفضل كل من الفاضل نجاح الحمدي الفاضل خالد الحريبي الدكتور خالد طحان الدكتور عمار العبيداني ويدير الجلسه الدكتور سالم الحارثي تفضل اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يو نو ناو ايفري وان خالد دكتور عمار اند Uh, uh, Mr. Khalid and uh, Najah and Hamdi, uh, these are expertise. And let us start with some questions from the audience, just to give you time for uh, discussion. You have seen the three presentations uh, from Dr. Khalid and Dr. Ammar and from myself. So the floor is open to some questions. Dr. Lamia, I want to exercise a little bit. Okay. Just. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Hajj, College of Science, Biology Department. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. It was a really, it was really an eye opener because I always struggled to understand blockchain, and I've done the googling and the, and the YouTube, and it, I think it gave me like one percent. I got a little bit further today. Uh, I don't claim to understand it fully, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, it was really nice to see how blockchain can revolutionize or disrupt, uh, like, uh, healthcare and risk management. But as an academic, I was hoping to hear a little bit about how blockchain can be integrated in academia and how that can affect um, you know, the future of academia. How can we actually use blockchain um, in, let's say, academia vision around 2040? Just to maybe just a, a little bit of an insight. So is that question to anyone? It's to anybody who has the answer, yes. So I'll leave this uh, anyone to decide. Uh, Dr. Khalid. Thanks for the question. Um, there's a lot of avenues within academia that you can look at. So certification is one we've already mentioned. So your graduation certificates, once, once they're verified and authenticated on the blockchain, you effectively have a tool which you can use worldwide. Uh, for us in medicine, uh, we always go for fellowships, residencies, etc. And we always have to have our certificates authenticated, they have to cross-check them, etc. You're eliminating all that hassle. Uh, so that's one method within academia. The second thing is research. Um, adding big data into and blockchain, you can actually, um, if you've heard of Apple's approach for research, they're actually collecting data on di uh, diabetics within the uh, Apple store. So that's a centralized application of data collection, which is Apple. But you can actually do that with blockchain, and there are some uh, institutions that already have blockchains that are that allow you to start store data. You effectively have the same thing I told you: your medical information with you, and you can choose to contribute your data to medical research. So you realize the extent or the scope if you have a worldwide pool of information that you're suddenly collecting information from. It's, it will revolutionize research. So. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. طبعا مشكورين. Thank you very much for uh, for uh, for inviting us to be to be here today. Especially thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Majda and مركز التعلم الذاتي and Bennett Learning Center. I think uh, I've learned a lot uh, today about blockchain. I'm so glad that uh, they spoke before me because you know I wouldn't have known to answer anything about blockchain. <laughs> But you know this is the beauty of what we are doing today is that. We have the chance now in Oman to be leaders in this field that is really new. I think the role of uh, universities and learning institutions, and, and especially the university here, is very sacred in making sure that we do two main things. Number one, I see that the academic institutions have the sacred duty of aligning the students with what are the national goals. And I think one of the very important national goals that I think Oman played uh, for centuries is leading, especially leading in the area of knowledge. We talk a lot about knowledge economy. In the past, we led in the area of marine knowledge, for example, um, and in conquering the seas. 
I think digital world and digital economy is a new area where we can, a man can lead. So I think academicians have a very secret law, role number one in uh, talking and engaging students. How do we lead in this new area? And with the, well, no nation can lead without having people who are competent in that field. So if we're talking about knowledge economy, we need um, uh, com competent uh, knowledge professionals. In this uh, area in, in particular, we need digitally competent students. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> financial technology and blockchain is one area of digital competence. If academicians can work together, what are the components of digitally competent students? That would be a very, very, very important first step. And the second step is, um, uh, which I find it's very important for universities to have, is how do we engage students into, into the ecosystem? There is a whole world outside the classroom. How do we link our students to the relevant parts of the ecosystem, to the uh, civil society organizations such as blockchain? You don't need to, uh, uh, Dr. Amar the troublemaker, you don't need to engage with him. But you know, the, the, uh, the blockchain club is a, a fantastic development. Uh, the, the, uh, um, and the private sector and the blockchain company is very important. Um, uh, the supporting institutions uh, like Riyadh, we, you know, we can guide people with feasibility studies, with incubation, places to start, financing, which is the best place if you need funding, for example. Without this ecosystem, uh, any effort is, will not be sustainable. So I think these are the two important roles of academicians. How do we engage our students first with the national goals? How do we make sure that you are digitally competent citizens? And the second thing is that how do we engage you with this beautiful ecosystem that is flourishing and developing right now? Uh, Dr. Alban. <coughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, I mean, thank you, Faris, uh, for the uh, informative uh, answer. Uh, again, we have, uh, yeah, Khair talked about an ecosystem. We are trying to do that now. Um, the easier way for the all of the academies to come and practice this and make it happen is the club. That's a platform was developed not for us, it's, it's for you, for those who are interested to develop it. Please register, communicate with me. If you have an idea, I can create a block for you, even if you want to call it education. I've got a training center in the uh, website. If you can come and develop it the way you think is right. Uh, we are, see, we don't want to restrict ourselves to normal trainings and short courses. Uh, like what I said, we are just trying to create the extra mind, but we can also develop uh, a fixed program, a master program, if you like. We so are talking about the academic strength into developing these technologies. But we we want to we want to make this smart. We don't want to just focus at blockchain. We do want to focus about all of the uh, cross-sector digital technologies. Uh, so please, I'm inviting you and all of the other academics who have the courage to come and support us in developing the society, to have a strong ecosystem around uh, blockchain or man company, as well as the entrepreneurial companies coming up. Now we have more than five private uh, companies, entrepreneurs. They have got technologies, and they are ready to pitch for their ideas to have it here in our mind. So we can, we can have this in a site, as well as have something within universities I didn't have enough time to talk about all of the things. Uh, each university <coughs> will have their own team within a university, and the team will be linked to the website. So the website will have a place for the different teams in the different academic institutions in Oman. And they will have their own events, and they will post their events in the website. If I get this right, is this the website, is it main purpose is to develop or just to uh, develop awareness, first of all, as a, as a See, it's more than that. It's a platform, an interactive platform, to support the development of the ecosystem. So even if we have an entrepreneur today in this uh, event, someone from the ladies, from the guys, who wants to be an entrepreneur, he can become a member 
and he can discuss his technology, and he can get trained through the website, and he can go to Riyadh, and he can go to Khalid, and he can have his own technology, an IP, and a product. So it's a platform that's not developed for just awareness. It's a platform developed for awareness and supporting the development of an ecosystem. OK, let us uh, take more uh, questions. Uh, uh, we'll come to you. Uh, uh, Dr. Lamia, also there are a lot of applications in that <coughs> institution. For example, you are uh, biotechnology. Yeah? What you can do when you want to patent, for example, patenting, it can be an application. Uh, academic integrity, it can be an, uh, an application using blockchain. So there are plenty of applications in the academic institution. I'll come to you, inshallah, Dr. Hatem. Assalamu alaikum. Hatem Shantri, my colleague at Sabah and Sassia. What are the current uh, bottlenecks in the system that's likely to slow down the blockchain uh, application in Oman? And what is the advantage of Oman starting a blockchain now? compared to doing other things uh, that are evolving around us? Interesting question, Dr. Khaled. So, um, adoption uh, is basically not adoption. Regulation can come as a bottleneck. However, luckily in Oman, we're working collaboratively. And we're actually looking at making sure the youth of Oman can innovate and go forward with the technology. So on the contrary, it's a very united uh, front when it comes to technology when in Oman, and that's a very big plus from a global perspective. Uh, furthermore, with regards to the technology, as we were discussing, it all comes together. Uh, big data is a big factor. Uh, the, uh, the West is collecting a lot of information on us when we should be commercializing that information to them rather than giving it for free. Uh, we could actually be collecting that data ourselves and becoming more knowledgeable and able to sell that data for, for, for security reasons or security services that are at re doing reviews in the future. So uh, the only reason I look at blockchain today is uh, two things. The internet came, it enables communication. So when you're looking at IoT devices, for example, they need to communicate, so the internet is there, and to transact between each other, they need blockchain. Okay, so these are foundational communication and transacting. And from there, you get the further matters, such as IoT being able to happen, so machines able to communicate with each other. Then you have collection of data and uh, artificial intelligence. But I look at these two as two found foundations. And the internet and the blockchain are foundations. OK, with regards to regulation, uh, and with the recent announcement of the right decree on the payment laws, uh, I think uh, I believe CBO is facilitating the implementation of fintech technologies and other related technologies like blockchain, digital currencies. We are also in the process of reviewing the banking law, and I think we would cater for more enhancement regarding the new technologies. So, are so we expecting yeah. any more than that in terms of? Uh, Oman coming up with its own currency, for example, digital well, currency. Digital currency. Um, so we are. It's an application that we're exploring now, so the door is not closed, and we are working closely with the blockchain uh, Oman company to explore this one, to explore the implementation of digital currency. The law is there to facilitate it, but we have to make sure that everything is secure and if a digital currency would be issued, it's going to be backed up with the uh, Amani Real. Okay, thank you. Um, um, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, it, it's an honor to have you here. Um, of course, uh, uh, something that is very important and in development that uh, Mrs. Najah just mentioned is the issuance of royal decree on um, uh, national payments. Um, a, a, from an entrepreneurship perspective, we think it's, it gives um, um, aspiring entrepreneurs a very, very strong uh, starting point in financial technology. So we have been witnessing over the past few years a lot of interest from students in financial technology, different applications of financial technology. With the issuance of the Royal Decree, we think now that reg um, regulation, from a regulation perspective, we have one of the most advanced safe starts 
uh, within the Gulf, if we, when we compared it with other regulations, we're second only to Bahrain because they've had a very early start when it comes to um, uh, financial technology related regulations. What I would really encourage uh, the students, please have a look at the uh, national payment royal decree because it provides a very good guidance of what are the facilities that you can get into as an entrepreneur. Um, and, and it was a very important part of the ecosystem. We've been waiting for it for a long time. And perhaps this is a sign. This is a sign that the, uh, it was only issued last month. So this is your chance because entrepreneurship depends on risk taking <coughs> and who takes that first step first. So I hope that now with this royal decree that was only issued uh, last month, if you were thinking about this, if this is the right time to get into it and start, inshallah. It's available on the website as well. Yes, uh, the cbo-roman.gov.gov.org. Uh, Dr. Ammar, do you want to add anything in this regard? No. Okay. Okay. Just to mention with regards to information, so the, the CBO will be also, uh, we will be linking information from so critical documents like the one that's just been mentioned will be available via the CBO and the club website. So we will be linking information between the two sites. Okay. Khaled, please don't take the decision about it. No, we discussed it yesterday. I need, I need to add one, one more thing. I mean, why, why, the question is, why are we having this today? And uh, again, my colleagues talked about the risk and opportunities. There's a high risk in the coming future that all of the jobs will change into a new Kind of jobs. And we need to spread this to everybody so that we are the pioneer in handling and developing these jobs. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be operator and you will lose the opportunity. And this is a message to be spread to everybody. The fourth industrial revolution is coming, whether we like it or not. And it's not coming as, uh, you know, detailed. It's coming with three topics, AI, biology, and something else. But the, the fact is, it's, it's so many things. 3D printing, it is uh, so many other technologies away from the digital technology. But the digital uh, technology is dominating now, and it is uh, speeding up uh, faster than the others. So uh, grab the opportunity and uh, minimize the risk by training yourself. Can I say something to Dr. Ammar? Dr. Ammar said that the fourth industrial our fourth uh, revolution industry is, is coming. Actually, it's not coming. It's already there, and we are living it. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see a doctor uh, running a company on blockchain, <laughs> changing careers. So this is really a revolution. Um, so the healthcare sector is definitely a place where we have, can have sanitation. And uh, Dr. Khalid gave a very good example of that. Um, definitely applicable with Taraman. Uh, it could be a national project in the healthcare sector to link the patient information, and we've been trying to do that. Um, Ministry of Health has been successful, but it's fragmented and it would be nice to have it across the country. However, when I think about the insurance companies, um, it definitely serves insurance companies, um, but our clients are the people and the patients. So how can we ensure the patient confidentiality, the medical legality of it, mm -hmm. and um, uh, consent? And even when we go to research, um, you know, data collection. The data collection is a big controversial issue now around the world because we know that Google and everybody else is collecting data, you know, on, on us, and we don't really give that consent for the data, but we are in a way. Um, so how is that going to be uh, regulated? How can it be insured? Is there a risk in that? And the second thing, the question maybe to the panel is. If we have um, a national project which involves different sectors uh, to be involved in a blockchain project, which is gonna be a huge project, how do we go about it? Where do we start? Uh, how do we approach the different uh, you know, institutions to collaborate together? And is there a forum for that? Well, two questions. The first one, privacy, how blockchain can handle that, 
and confidentiality also. The second one is really bringing everybody together. Sure. Thanks for both questions, actually, because uh, so the first one, if you remember, we were talking about a private key. The private key is actually in control of the patient. So the insurance company does not have access to your record. You give him access when you want to. So you are in control. And furthermore, you can give him access for an hour and revoke it in an hour. And the idea is just, for example, if you go to a hospital right now, you are going, filling up papers, till they give you the report, then you submit it to the insurance company. You're improving that efficiency over here. But the idea of blockchain is that control is in your hands. So you are giving access and revoking it when you want. So you're in full control of your own medical data. Secondly, with regards to research, again, the idea is you're in control. Do you want to contribute to the research? Do you want to contribute data to Google, uh, to Facebook, sorry, and Google? They don't give you that option. But there is a Google now where you can switch it off if you want. So that's the idea. The idea is we will give you a platform to store your data, just like Facebook provides you a platform to store your photos. But in return, would you be willing to contribute to medical research? You choose again. So it's all user-based power. That's what blockchain changes. It changes it to the user rather than a central entity dictating how things go. On the second front, we actually have already a national initiative project that in touches based on five, <laughs> five uh, institutions. Uh, we're, what we're doing is we are, because we're setting up infrastructure right now, we're looking at the projects that are literally one entity takes forward. That is being diverted till after the infrastructure is set up. But if you have a project that is quite extensive, we, we are more than happy between the club and us, we are more than happy to take that forward for you to all the ministries that are related. So we are happy to take charge of that if you want. Uh, furthermore, so we can, we're happy to discuss it and guide with that or literally facilitate everything related to it. Because we want to stimulate that if you have a brilliant idea, we want to make sure it's, the, it's out there. Anyone who wants to add how to bring people together? Uh, um, I, th I think um, uh, uh, one thing that uh, the uh, Blockchain Club and the company also have been very proactive. They have been approaching different organizations to work on pilot projects. And uh, we are in talks. Uh, you know, one, one example is the upgrade program. I would like uh, students, especially those who are uh, almost graduating, to check uh, upgrade uh, collaboration between the Research Council Riyada, Oman Tel, Oman Technology Fund, and the National Youth Commission. And part of it is a, a grant that will be given and an incubation that will be given to certain graduation projects that are related to smart cities and blockchain as well. And also there are logistics uh, projects that are within uh, between Riyada and the oil and gas industry, such as PDO. And we are in talks also about how can we use this as a pilot uh, collaboration project. Uh, another thing uh, about the uh, privacy, uh, last month I've got a chance to travel with a group to Estonia where they are using blockchain in the different, uh, uh, different services. One of them was the Ministry of, uh, they have the Ministry of Health and Social Services together. And they showed us how the power uh, of the user works, the power of citizens. So uh, part of the uh, benefits of blockchain and controlling your records is that you can also see who is accessing your records. And they have an organization that is similar to the uh, Information Technology Authority. Uh, it's called RIA in Estonia, where the citizen can check who has been accessing his records and why. So the citizen is fully in control of your records. That really helps in the area of uh, blockchain. So not only that you can control it through the private keys, even after you give permissions, if you notice sometimes I'm sitting at home and I see that uh, you know, Dr. Ammar is, Ammar is playing around with my records, I can go to RIA or the ITA of Estonia and ask them why at 9 o'clock in the morning Dr. Ammar was looking in my records. That is my right as a citizen. Why, Dr. Ammar? Okay, Why? then we'll, we'll move to Dr. Ammar. <laughs> Why? Explain yourself. I like, I like going to different people's records. <laughs> I'll answer the second question uh, about the collaboration. I mean, that was the idea, like I've explained earlier. When we started uh, planning uh, the symposium, we had to bring everybody on board. Uh, we started with the CBO, and they were very helpful to communicate us with the rest. 
related to their work. So we worked out different uh, pilot projects from both the financial and the service sectors. And we brought them, uh, you know, the project owners aboard. And that helped us after the uh, symposium. Um, obviously, there were a few organizations. After the symposium, we had the Ministry of Environment approaching us. They wanted to develop a program. We had uh, other ministries, <coughs> like Ministry of Health, Ministry of uh, uh, Medical, Medical Specialty Board, also came to us. Uh, the Ministry of Commerce, they have a system. They want to now you know, uh, support it with blockchain to hash all of their pro processes. So the strength of whatever you see today is because uh, we've started with an institutional kind of uh, gathering towards an objective. Well, you can see a little bit of stakeholder management. Once every institution they see the benefits, they come to you. You don't even have to invite them. Let us give a chance to our students. Uh, students first. You are a student. Okay, please. Uh, I'm a master's student part time. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about the blockchain. I was following up all different sites that people suffer for online sort of uh, simple sort of uh, courses just to understand what is it that's all and about uh, what can it, it brings to, to our uh, uh, so business center. Uh, and my question is uh, actually with respect to uh, we want blockchain to improve the, the efficiency and one of the things that we mentioned about the efficiency of the government. Mm -hmm. And my question is uh, do really we have to wait until the, the development and the full development of blockchain because it's, it is an evolving technology. However, if you look at how Things are are working in, in, in our in our system, in our uh, the whole economy. If you, I mean, just take uh, either the government or even private sectors, you can see the slowness and the inequality and uh, the bureaucracy. You can you can put it in one word. And if blockchain is going to bring us to the the efficiency, also the transparency and so on. So I think first we start to how we can change the minds, the mindset before we can move to the technology, because the technology is technology. I mean, third revolution is it is going, and we are in the fourth. How much we have to <coughs> how much, or how much we have missed of opportunities of the third revolution. We can do a lot with the simple technology, cheap technologies. I mean, it's good that you present to us as a student, that something to inspire us to follow on uh, and, uh, the blockchain technology. But I think also, just we are missing a lot. A lot of wood based technology, simple technology that can be implemented in all sectors. And we are all dreamers, and that's good, but also we, we should also be, look at the re reality and just look something which is up behind us, or at the very, very close to us. Uh, that is my comment, so my question, if you can comment on that. Well, I think it was clear. Do we have to wait for the technology? I think the technology there. Many questions, in fact, you can comment. <coughs> Uh, thanks for that question, actually. Uh, if you realize, I told you, this is not an Omani race. This is an international race. You're not in it for Oman only. You're in it for the world. So you're going to become an asset to the world, not just Oman. So every, every application for the fourth uh, revolution, we're going to be part of it in Oman. We are doing that. So that's what, why we are working collaboratively. But at the same time, you can actually become a tool for the world. Uh, so it's not only about uh, Oman. It's very critical to realize that. This is an international perspective here. Uh, so anything you can develop, because this is a decentralized thing, you can launch it worldwide. We have someone who is creating something that is just as or disruptive as Bitcoin is. And I told him, forget it. It's going to take us a bit of time in Oman. Launch it worldwide. Forget about Oman, for, for example. But there's a lot of things that this actually improves our actual systems. You were saying it, government services. We want to improve services to our citizens. The technology brings it to us easily. So we will be doing that. On the contrary to any past that you're describing, 
we are going to do it, and we will be utilizing the technology to improve services to citizens. Khalid, please. Uh, thank you very much. This is an excellent question, and I think you're an excellent role model for the young students. I'm glad that you have your startup already at the National Business Center. And I think uh, the answer is that exactly what you have done. Uh, uh, we, uh, we spend our whole lives waiting. We wait for things to be complete. We think we wait for the ecosystems to emerge. We wait for, every, for the, all the conditions to be perfect. I think patience is very important when we have been waiting for a very long time. Now is the time for action. The ecosystem is complete. The information and the knowledge is there. The international examples are there. The market is ready. And the, the, the civil society is ready. The government is ready. Now is the time for action. So no more, no more waiting for the fourth industrial revolution. Like Mrs. Najah said, uh, fourth industrial revolution is not coming. It is already it is already here, so it's the time for action. And you said something that is very important, and I hope this message is for everyone. Uh, fourth Industrial Revolution is not about technologies. It is first about the mindset, about the risk-taking, about solving international issues. Then comes the technologies, and the technologies will change with time. Again, to the example of Estonia, which is the number one country now in digital leadership, we listened to 30 speakers over the span of one week. None of them spoke about the technology first. They spoke about the principles, the values, the mindset. Then they said that the everything else that the technology came, and it's the country that brought Skype and many other. Now their blockchain technology is being used in the US. But first, that we got the first principles uh, right. Like Dr. Khaled said, they got the, you know, that citizen is first. They got the privacy, the cyber security, everyone believed uh, in this, then the technology application became easy. So I, I agree with you, that it's, the, it's about the mindset. But I encourage, please, if you were waiting, you did a very good job, patience is very important, but you know, this is not the time for waiting, this is the time for action. Yes. <coughs> about the mindset, no one can change it for you. No, no, no initiative, no government, no one can do that if you're not willing to do so. So it, it's self, you know, motivation. You, you have to do it for yourself. You have to change. You have to see how the world is working and adapt to it. So you, you cannot wait for the government to, to introduce new technologies, new systems, new anything. It won't help if you are, if you are not willing actually to, to change by ourselves and use this technology. I think that's a key, very, very important aspect, changing your, yourself first, then you can lead, then uh, really accelerate and create this momentum. More questions? Okay, uh, I'm Saeed Barami, PhD student here in SQA, and uh, I'm doing my research and thesis about blockchain. So I hope I'm the first to agree. Uh, I have a specific question for Dr. Khaled. First of all, you know the most barriers we are handicapping us is the security and bureaucracy. And as you know, it's the blockchain is the solution for these two issues. What is the plan or the vision of your company or Oman blockchain to break these barriers and to improve and enhance the, the blockchain technology and even the efficiency of the government? The, the second question, or actually it's not a question, it's surprising. Uh, doctor, as you know, we are in the new Oh, so uh, cryptocurrency, as you know, like it's it's the future. Everyone is agree that is the future. I hope there is a plan instead of exploring for the cryptocurrency. Uh, this is okay. Let us start with uh, uh, Dr. Khalid, then uh, Najah. If you have any comments, <laughs> <laughs> she wants to be a nanotechnologist. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, on, uh, so, from regards to the security and uh, bureaucracy or privacy? Bureaucracy. So with regards to bureaucracy, as we were saying earlier, blockchain technology can prove to be a threat or can prove to be a tool. And luckily, in our mind, we're looking at it as the latter, a tool, okay? And we are looking at it to actually bring forward services, improve services within the government sector. And uh, so I don't see the challenges that you described because we are luckily a united team. Um, 
So does that answer it for you? Being, being transparent, truthfully, it is actually very wonderful the way it's going because it is being a united team and going forward for the one goal of improving your chances to be world leaders in this space. Specifically, the students, because that is that is really where it is. I've I've got a young guy. He literally gave, talked to me about an idea. I told him it's brilliant. Uh, he started developing it. Then there was a, a query about something that might be blocking it in Oman. Okay, it was clarified that it's not blocking it, and it's continuing. But he was the person. That's why we we're saying it's the spirit starts in you, because he was ready from today. If it was okay, if it was, there was going to be a roadblock in Oman, he was going to jump to Gibraltar. To register, that's where I say the spirit. There is nothing that can stop your own spirit. If you really want it, you're gonna run after it. And uh, Alhamdulillah, policies in Oman work. He's still continuing in Oman. And there's two others that are in Switzerland. We want to try and bring them to Oman, and we're working on that as well. They're Omanis, registered companies in Switzerland. You, as a researcher, doing PhD in blockchain. If the question is how we can tackle bureaucracy through blockchain. It's very simple. Put a parameter of time. If you define the bureaucracy, just things, delays, then blockchain will be a solution. But my first question is about the priority of the spirit. You know, the spirit isn't an person who should be about the spirit. How to enhance the security among the Oman agencies here Use it by using the blockchain? Sure. You have a plan. Improve security. So, from a security perspective, blockchain as a technology to date has not been hacked. Yeah, okay. that's right. Uh, so, it improves services. Uh, privacy is a different story. That's why you don't actually store data on the blockchain. You store it in a cloud and you only hash it on the blockchain because private, uh, the blockchain is not efficient at storing data itself. So, there is the data that's being stored on, on the actual transaction, and then you have the transactional data itself. So transactional data itself becomes uh, sensitive for banking sectors, for example. So that's where you need to start segregating things into potentially like channels and hyperledger. But with regards to the uh, data itself, we don't store data for privacy reasons. And it is remaining on cloud uh, storage for that institution, which is hyperlinked to that data with a hash to authenticate it. I have that answer. For more details, uh, we can provide the contact addresses for the panelists so you can discuss more. Students, if not, then we'll move on. Hold on. Have a conflict of interest. Mazi Chawazi, <laughs> Master of Student from College of Economics and Political Science. I'm doing also research on the role of FinTech in international military regime and to enhance political economy. And you are but from CBO. Well, uh, but I'm not a student from CBO. <laughs> so my question is different. It's about the national identity. So the United Nations have started the project of national identity. Also, the Canada has started also national identity project in blockchain. Is there any plan for Oman or collaboration between Oman blockchain company and the ROP to implement the uh, national identity for Oman citizens in blockchain? My first question. Second question. Uh, like down the line for the coming five years, is there any pipeline project which is uh, available or the plan with you to implement the uh, blockchain? Let's say, for example, uh, for the inherited system, it could be also to be in the smart contract as well. It will be easy for distribution for the world. So, this is one example. Uh, and what about the others? Is there any pipeline for the coming five years? Thank you very much. As far as that, we are talking about projects. Uh, Dr. Khalid will answer this question. Then I'll ask the panelists also uh, to talk about projects uh, uh, between you, all parties, uh, or some trial uh, or some examples of the projects going on. Thanks for the question. Um, first of all, we didn't answer his second part, which we'll get back to about cryptocurrencies. <laughs> but, uh, with regards to the identity platform, it is on our agenda. We have not initiated communication yet, but it is on our agenda to initiate. Uh, the second part with regards to applications. So we are predominantly, for phase one, focusing on infrastructure. And on that infrastructure, we're putting in the national initiative project. Okay, That's phase one. Phase two will come into more complex projects, which as Dr. Maha has mentioned, which might in entail multiple entities together, collaborative efforts. So we wanna make sure it proves itself, right? 
and we prove itself with good proof of concept, pro solve real problems. You actually have a problem that you're being that you're solving. So even if, say, for example, five years from now the technology gets standardized into something else, it doesn't matter. You solved the problem. Why do you need to upgrade? You've already solved it. So uh, that's that's where we're what we're doing for phase one, and then phase two will come into more. Uh, complex projects that are multiple institutional and uh, that's really where we're looking at it. In five years, in three years, we should be having at least three or four projects that we are king worldwide. Otherwise, yeah. So cryptocurrencies. Okay, I, I'll, I'll make a comment. <laughs> I'll make a comment. Trading of cryptocurrencies is one use case, and that's a use case we don't want to see for our money. That's a fact. Okay? Trading can make people lose a lot of money. Okay? That's not our objective here. However, if you tell me I need to pay someone in Estonia to develop something for me, and he only takes bitcoins, you should not be restricted. Okay? So the use case of trading is something we're not going to be supporting very much. But to enable you to utilize the coins for a valid reason, Ethereum, a de decentralized application, heck yeah, you should be able to do that. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to... <laughs> so <laughs> not through local banks. No, 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 not to clarify. So what we're trying to do is there are certain things about permissionless blockchains that represent security risks to Oman. Okay? We have to control that first. Once that's controlled and everything seems fine, that's when we can. We have to minimize the risk. In the end of the day, yes, we want to enable you to pay a developer in Estonia to develop something, but we don't, don't want to enable someone from God knows where to come here and do a terrorist activity. So it's a two-way road. We have to control the risk. That's, that's basically what I'm trying to say. However, I will pass on to... Okay. I am interested in knowing. <laughs> okay. Central bank is the is the regulator, and cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency. There is a difference between cryptocurrency and digital currency. And this is why cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I didn't see yet a central bank who has regulated cryptocurrency or approved cryptocurrency. Uh, most of central banks have set the send warnings and we did the same as well. I think uh, you've seen one in December. Yes. Um, but we, we don't also encourage people to use it because it's not regulated. And as most of us knows that 50% of transactions used now are for money laundering, crimes, drug stealing. So we don't want to go there because it's not regulated, it's not monitored. We don't know where the money goes and where it comes from. So I think it's a bit early to agree with what Dr. Pahan is saying. But uh, talking about digital currency, it's a totally different uh, aspect. And it's going to be backed up with the area, it's going to be regulated, it's going to be monitored. Uh, and we are still, when I say exploring it and investigating it, it's a high risk area. And uh, our concern is the stability of the financial sector in Oman. So we want to make sure that whatever we approve, whatever we implement is secure, efficient, and effective. Um, if I may thank you, that these are very important questions. I just want to make uh, two points. Uh, point number one is one of the role of uh, SME authorities and, and, and Riyadh is to give people thoughts how they can make sustainable and growing businesses. So number one, uh, with regards to the services that maybe blockchain could go into, globally, and again with the example of Estonia, uh, the door is open. Imagine all the services that the government offers. Globally now, it is known that all of these services could be digitized or could be on blockchain except for three. Uh, marriage, you, you can imagine by getting married through blockchain. <laughs> you know, marriage, <laughs> divorce. It's a chain. <laughs> we have kids in blockchain, is it? Kifaya, <laughs> 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 
So, <laughs> of course, with, uh, with, with marriage, you have divorce and land, uh, land transactions. So everything in the world, just imagine, the world is your oyster. You can do any, you can digitize any service or look into how to, how to blockchain it. And in addition to the 19, or especially in the 90 services that Dr. Khal talked about, the number one, number 19, your industry, everything is open for your imagination and your creativity and your innovation, except for marriage, please don't try it, <laughs> divorce and land transactions. Okay, so we have thousands of services, which if you are looking for more guidance. I am a very big believer in asymmetric innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you all know, asymmetric innovation is observing your society, observing your community, observing your friends, your students in the classroom. What do they need help with? What's emerging without any government interference or without private sector interference? Why are people, you know, all of a sudden doing something in particular? Maybe going to Dubai and buying abayas, or uh, importing uh, construction material for their houses from China. These kinds of, uh, of the sudden trend by the masses or by groups of people are usually a sign of asymmetric innovation, which is a part of disruptive innovation. So I think your role is not to go very far. Sometimes the answer is just right next to you. So check your friends, your students, your families. What are the new trends that are happening by themselves? Uh, and this, there, there will be your answer. If it is happening without any interference from the government and the private sector, there is a business opportunity for, for you there. Just ask yourself, can the machine do it? Or can it be digitized or can it be uh, blockchain? But please, again, the most important message, do not try marrying through <laughs> blockchain. <laughs> Okay, because the time is against us, I'll ask the panelists uh, only one minute for the final word. One minute. Thanks. Mine is not going to be one minute. I'm purely saying the next two years is literally your ball game. You can make or break yourself with one of the best races around the world. I would definitely take it. I've diverted from medicine for this. Okay. Um. Um, uh, my message is that, uh, you know, I hope that we are all can be as a part of our national duty. Part of being a good citizen now is being digitally competent. So please do your part, whether you are a teacher or a student or an administrator. How can I help myself and others become digitally competent? And use the system, the ecosystem around you. How can you be part of civil society? How can you be part of uh, uh, the private sector? And more importantly, please get to know the regulations. The regulations are done after very, very uh, serious efforts by the entities and after consultations and after years so that they can serve you. And all we need to do is just log online and try to get those uh, services. Uh, and again, please, if you try to manage through blockchain and something happens, I'm not responsible. <laughs> That's your, your responsibility. <laughs> You have, pro you have promoted the idea. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, you never know. Probably <laughs> um, I would encourage you all and request you to be innovative, to, to be entrepreneurs, to start your own projects. And uh, not only in blockchain, explore fintech, internet of things, artificial intelligence. And we are all here to support you and to assess you. You may fail once, twice, or more. But at the end, I'm sure you're going to succeed. And so don't give up. Don't give up on your ideas, your projects. Don't give up on your plans, on your friends who support you, people surrounding you. Allah yufakum, inshaAllah. Dr. Ammar. Allah yufakum. I already saw myself getting married to you. I'm not going imagination. I think uh, what I need to say is, 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 is very simple. Please be part of the ecosystem. Please utilize those services we are trying to provide. Uh, all of this is, I call it free efforts. It's because we love this country. It's because we want to do a difference. It's because everybody knows that it's a race. Those who are rich faster, those who will be having the capacity within uh, their country those who will be having the uh, most uh, economic impacts and be leaders in the world. Uh, 
the shift in different uh, industrial revolutions made a lot of newcomers in the game to be really rich with their uh, industry.